Today's program is uh, being presented by Gordon Feller, and it's very, I think, a hot topic. The future of transportation in the light of telecommuting and autonomous vehicles, we call driverless cars. Um, I've been very fascinated by this. I've talked about this uh, at various city council meetings and at the supervisors. Uh, we're really in a place where we're having quite a revolution brought to us in technology that's now coming down from just the internet to the world of things. And the biggest thing that we basically are looking at in our world here is our cars. Oh, that's interesting. You're right up here and it really comes alive. Uh, Gordon was the director of urban innovation at Cisco Systems. And he now serves there as a consultant. Prior to Cisco, he was the CEO of Urban Age Institute. And in that capacity, he advised many multinational companies, cities, foundations, and governments on economic and technology issues. He's a graduate of Columbia University, uh, where he served as a uh, Lehman Wallach and Dean's Fellow at the university. Currently, uh, he is on the board of directors of a very interesting organization called Meeting of the Minds, which you can meet at Meetings of the Minds, that's plural, uh, dot org. He also is serving as a member of a think tank at the Smithsonian while retaining his activities at, at Cisco. He referred to himself to me as a uh, one-third, one-third person. I imagine he's been very busy at all these things. During his talk and perhaps afterwards, uh, he wants to, and I would like you to pay attention to this uh, event that he's going to be holding at this meeting area over in Richmond, where uh, these issues concerning the future of urban communities is going to be uh, highlighted and uh, probably something that those of you might be particularly interested in this will want to attend. So, uh, we will go straight to our program. Here's Gordon Feller. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. And I'm glad to be here. Uh, Carol has told me about what you're doing uh, many times. So. Now I get a chance to actually see what Carol and Clayton and the rest of you have been up to. Uh, I promised Clayton that I wouldn't scare you with uh, scenarios of machines taking over and robots uh, uh, being, being the dominant force in our lives, but I am going to tell you the story of what's happening with essentially robot cars, which you will see on our roads if you haven't already very soon. Not just Google cars, but I believe it was yesterday or the day before that uh, one of the Uber cars picking up passengers uh, in San Francisco was spotted by some journalists who were looking for the story. And it was one of Uber's robotic cars picking, picking up passengers in San Francisco. There are now a hundred of Uber's robot cars on the roads in Pittsburgh picking up passengers. So we're, we're not too far from the day when you will be driven to your doctor's appointment or to a retail store, if we have retail stores in the future, uh, by, by uh, your friendly robot, which is probably not going to be a car that you own, but it'll be part of the fleet. And we're going to talk about what the impact of all of that looks like in, in today's Marin, because it's not too far from today when I think Marin is going to be challenged by a real revolution, and that was the word that Clayton used, so I'll, I'll borrow that from him. But let's go back to the last automotive revolution, uh, back to 1898, just before Henry Ford, uh, just a few years before the automotive revolution, which really you could say was about 110 years ago. And there was a conference, the first really serious international conference on urban planning that convened in New York. And um, what was the obsession? The obsession was horses and horse poop. There were 20 million horses moving us around our cities, and the poop was piling up. Uh, I'm sorry I have to say this in the middle of lunch, but it was, a real, it was a real problem in that day. And urban planners were focused on a very long-term uh, poop 
preoccupied future where they didn't really know what could we do, and it was a big dilemma. And of course, you know, there were people there who were investing in, in the uh, National Buggy Whip Corporation, uh, which I don't believe is currently trading on the New York Stock Exchange any longer. Um, so the oncoming avalanche of the automotive revolution was really completely invisible to really smart people who were thinking about the future of cities in 1898. Uh, lo and behold, just a couple of decades later at the World's Fair, uh, General Motors uh, in the 30s decided to say what the future of automotive was. And they thought just around the corner, because GM prided itself on having a team of people who uh, were futurists that looked around the corners, they said the future of cars coming soon was an automotive was was an automated vehicle. Uh, I think that at that time they called it um, a robot car. Robot, by the way, is a Russian word. Um, and so that first wave of the automotive revolution really forced a lot of rethinking about cities. Um, and we can discuss a lot of the nuances of what happened when automotive companies decided, for instance, to buy up and to tear up. Uh, light rail systems in cities all across the United States to make cities more dependent on cars. We'll come back to that. But I wanted you to really kind of look at this moment that we're at in the, in the, the road, the fork in the road. Uh, one path leads to heaven, I think, or something pretty close to it in, in, in terms of urban mobility, and the other leads to hell. And I'm going to try and describe what that looks like, but bear with me because it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. And unlike most of the jigsaw puzzles that we're used to, where the box you know, has a picture of what you're supposed to paint with that jigsaw puzzle, we really don't know what that future is exactly going to look like. So I'm going to describe different segments and different puzzle pieces, and maybe together we can figure this out. So let's, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, so 110 years ago, Henry Ford make, basically creates that revolution. Um, and about 50 years ago, you know, we made a really complete transition from the horse uh, and buggy uh, to the car. And you know, the Amish people are, are holding out, but I, I suspect that this is this is just a matter of time. Um, but now, the estimate by economists is that two out of every eight hours at work are spent, you know, paying off your car and associated car expenses. Um, that's 35,000 people a year in the United States dying, somewhere between 35 and 37,000 dying from car accidents a year. That's 4.4 million people seriously injured in car accidents. I think the global number, I was looking at the World Health Organization stats, is something like, it's, it's an amazing number, um, tens of millions, oh, 28,000 people a week worldwide being killed in automotive accidents. That's a, that's a Hiroshima every month, essentially. So if we, you know, if we look at a city, I just came back from Singapore, if we look at a city-state like Singapore, almost 15% of their total land mass is car-related. Parking, parking structures, roads, traffic systems. So they've made a decision that they want to transition because really they have no other resource. They don't have any fresh water. They have to make it. Um, they use toilets to tap, by the way. Uh, they don't have any oil. They don't have any gas. They've just got basically people. Their only resource is human capital. So they decided to become the first adopter. So on the streets in Singapore, I saw robotic cars uh, because they decided to become the first adopter. Uh, it's a little easier for an island nation, but not that much easier. They're having some challenges, and we'll talk about those. But my argument today is that we have a once in a century, maybe once in a millennium opportunity to have a do-over. Right? We made the big choice at the beginning of the automotive revolution to adapt our cities and mold our cities around the vehicle. We have a choice now about whether we want to keep with that on the, the hell side or make another choice on the heaven side. So let me, let me paint the picture for you a little bit. Um, It's pretty clear from the research that's now taking place amongst not just the car companies, but those who don't have a vested interest in selling the actual automobile, that fleets 
are going to be the place where automotive, where, where autonomous vehicles, which by the way is the phrase of the moment, instead of robot cars, which sounds pretty scary, uh, they're being called AVs. So these automated vehicles, these autonomous vehicles, um, maybe 60 to 90 percent of all cars are going to be owned by a fleet. You won't own a private car anymore. Because frankly, your car is sitting unused 90 percent of its time. It's not a very good investment for 10, 15, 20, whatever numbers of thousands of dollars that you're spending on your car. It's not a very good investment to have that kind of uh, what economists call asset utilization. It's just not. So the number of cars that are sold in a, in, to a fleet, let's say a Marin-based fleet to serve Marin residents, is going to be much lower because it will have a lot more utilization. You're not going, Frida, to your doctor's appointment at the same time as Carol is going to her doctor's appointment. And so there's going to be a vehicle that drops you off, picks you up, drops you off, and then goes and does Carol. And might, for the whole you know, 20 hour cycle, be busy never really parking. So that's the vision for the automotive future. The AV is not a car that you own. It's owned by a fleet, just like Uber and Lyft essentially are providing you a fleet to get you a solution to get from point A to point B. The usage efficiency goes up, but the number of cars that are made and sold goes down, which means the million plus people who make cars, we might not have a million automotive jobs for manufacturing. And likewise, if cars are automated and AVs don't crash, which is the vision that, that uh, we'll talk about hopefully a bit today, and which seems to be realistic, because cars don't drink and drive, cars don't get distracted by text messaging when they're driving themselves, and uh, cars don't get tired. These are all the reasons why people have accidents. And when you're taking those elements out of the equation, and it's a piece of software that's talking to the roadway and talking to other vehicles and learning from the whole experience of all of those vehicles, uh, you know, it could be a revolution in not just how many cars, but how many accidents. So from the healthcare savings standpoint, because remember how many people are dying and being injured, um, we make save tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars because of all those people who show up expecting that the public is going to take care of their head injury as a result of that accident that they had. Uh, we think the direct cost in healthcare, there's some debate among economists about this, is maybe $250 billion a year. That's a lot of healthcare related costs from car injuries. The indirect cost, quality of life for people who've been injured, could be as much as another $800 billion. If you've seen the effect of a car accident on somebody you know, it can really be a serious impact on their productivity, in the economy, and their quality of life generally. So let's talk about financial impacts. If you're not parking a car as much as you were in the pre-robot world, and the AV is moving around in that fleet because you're not owning that car, the fleet owns the car, and you're essentially renting it on a time basis for your drop-off, pick-up and drop-off. Well, what about the parking income? This is the second largest piece of income in most cities after direct tax. So all of a sudden, parking meter income goes down, and parking fines income goes down. This is a pretty significant bite on the municipal budget. But let's talk about the broader economy for a moment, insurance. If cars are not having accidents, what happens to that couple of hundred billion dollars a year that we're all spending on our car insurance to protect against accidents? And all those insurance salespeople. So I, I want you to get a sense as I spell out some of the pieces of the puzzle that this could be disruptive. I mean, let me just tell you about people who depend on driving as their primary occupation. Three and a half million truck drivers in the United States. 650,000 people whose full-time job is driving a bus. 230,000 taxi drivers, who are not very happy, by the way, about Uber and Lyft right now. So um, if these people are going to be dislocated the way that farmers were dislocated when we mechanized agriculture, because 
really, it was a, not too long ago, 120 years maybe, when 80% of the U.S. economy was agriculture and 80% of the jobs was agriculture. I think now it's about 4% at the max. So there's going to be this radical and possibly very fast adjustment to a new emerging technology. And in a couple of years, we're going to start seeing the impacts of this. This is the first wave of the automation revolution. A lot of jobs uh, are going to go away the way that travel agents how many of us know a travel agent who's full-time employed doing travel agency work? Uh, I, I doubt there's anybody. Uh, I can name half a dozen jobs that have disappeared that just in the last few years are no longer serious categories in the Department of Labor stats. So every technology disrupts something, but of course creates new opportunities. And what the tech guys in Silicon Valley are telling you at Cisco, at Google, at Apple, is that, yeah, we're going to lose a lot of jobs, but there are going to be new jobs created. Not so sure. You know, the American Trucking Association says that their hope is that the regulators will force, even if the trucks are automated, and they have this sort of uh, carpooling program called platooning, where the trucks going across the country are just one right after the other, and they're all paced, and the Europeans are doing this now. Um, they're hoping that it will still require somebody in the cab. Uh, the question is whether that person will stay awake or not. But now we get to some of the more subtle impacts. Let's think about land use. If we don't have as many cars parked, what do we do with all that parking space that we now allocate to cars, the blacktop? Could we have more parks? Could we have more housing in places that want more housing? Could that housing be more affordable because essentially the land is cheap because now there's an abundance of land? What impact is it going to have on land that wasn't so cheap? Will it deflate the value of land because suddenly there's a whole lot more land in the market? My question, of course, because of how green Marin County is, uh, is not so much about more parks. It's about what the impact is going to be if we choose heaven or hell if we have more congestion. And here's the more congestion scenario for ADs. If you do own a car, or if it's really cheap to have the car available whenever you want it, because these, these vehicles would be a lot less expensive to make, because they don't crash into each other. And a lot of the cost is that heavy metal weight protecting you around the cab. You're not going to have a steering wheel, but you're also not going to need a lot of protection the way you used to need protection and still do today. So if it's lighter, if it's cheaper, and maybe it's just as inexpensive for me to have the car drive around waiting for me to finish my doctor's appointment because it's electric vehicle, it's not polluting. There might be a whole lot of zombie cars congesting the roads because, you know, I might be at home and I want three errands to be run. Right now, I have put my three errands in my head and I'm thinking, okay, when am I going to go out and do my three errands this week? As soon as I think about my errand, my, my robot's out there doing my errand. I need to pick up something at Home Depot. Boom. I can send my robot car. It's cheap. I need it now. I'm not going to wait four days when I can get myself scheduled to go to Home Depot. So what's the prospect of you know heaven versus hell? Well, it's, it's a mystery to me. What, what kinds of regulatory choices we're going to make and what kinds of, of um, you know, human choices. The technology, by the way, seems to be resolved. And let me explain before I go into the, the human factor why we're at this point right now and not five years ago or five years from now. And it's something that you'll see described when you read about how machines learn. Uh, machine learning is something that really is relatively new. It was thought about by science fiction writers for decades, if not centuries, that machines could learn. But now we actually have the technology, and it's, it's, it's an artificial intelligence solution uh, called deep learning. So in the world that you know, we're accustomed to, there's, there's really two big extremes in driving. There's the, I need to stay you know, focused on getting from point A to point B. Right? I want to get my car, my robotic car, from here to Civic Center. And I have you know, two options. I can go one-on-one or I can go the, the side roads. And basically, it's a very simple math problem calculated really 
in real time, instantly. And the maps are there, and the weather conditions are clear, and my robot car can do that. Also, it can plan for the long distance. The, I want to go to Sacramento, and I want to plan my trip. And I want the robot to do it for me, because I'm going to be on a conference call or take a nap or write a book. But it's the middle ground which is difficult, which is figuring out as I'm going from point A to point B, that child in the road on the bicycle, what do I do? Do I stop? Do I hope the car behind me stops? All those little micro decisions between here and there. It's not getting that long distance traffic plan. It's not operating the car from point to point. Um, it's these little micro decisions along the way, which is called the middle field. And fortunately, deep learning by machines, where they learn from each other. One car does this, and another car instantly through the artificial intelligence network, because all these cars are connected to each other. And you'll hear the car companies talk about the connected car. Because as, as Clayton was saying, the internet is now not just the internet of words and pictures and music and movies, which is essentially what we've had since the development of the internet. Now it's the internet of things. So all the stuff, the lights, the doors, the cars, are now being connected to the internet. Some people call it the internet of everything, because it's not just the things, it's the data streaming off those things that change the business process, for instance, in this case, how I drive, how I get around, which ultimately change my experience of the world. So things, data, process, ultimately the people. So you'll see sometimes it's described as the internet of everything. Because 99% of the world is not connected to the internet. People are connected to the internet, and some of our devices are connected to the internet. About 10 billion, 15 billion devices are connected to the internet. It's quickly becoming 50 billion. And Clayton and I, before we started, were talking about the technology adoption rate that's accelerating. So you look at the numbers of years that it took for us to adopt electricity and to make it ubiquitous, to make it a, 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 a commonplace part of our lives. We're now five times faster at the adoption rate for a new emerging technology. That's why this is happening a lot faster, because just a few years ago, uh, when Google was asked when do they think this technology would become available for commercial use, they were not saying 2020, which is what most of the car companies are now saying in being very conservative. Although, of course, Tesla is essentially selling an autonomous car. So, I would say that, you know, when we're looking down this path, that is it going to be heaven or is it going to be hell? The deciding factor is going to be whether we participate in the decisions that have to get made about what kind of mass transit versus private transit versus hybrid transit, shared, shared transit. So there's about a million people now who do shared mobility in the United States. And a very large portion of the people in the Bay Area who choose Uber and Lyft are using rideshare because it's less expensive, but they also get to meet other people. They share the ride from point to point. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, why, why are we still seeing in this moment, millennials become very enthusiastic about buying cars. Because this was a bit of a surprise. And you can find some, some uh, articles on the web when you search for it, and it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. One phenomenon is, of course, that when you have a child, it's a lot different to get a stroller and a diaper bag and a milk bottle and a car seat with you to that Uber pickup. Now, Uber and Lyft will adapt and presumably have a fleet of cars that are ready for the mobile mother slash child, uh, but it's not a very convenient future right now. Presumably with enough demand, the market will respond with a solution. But there's that desire for personal space. I would prefer, in some cases, not to be in a public transit mode. Uh, I would, you know, discover when I'm looking at my job and I'm looking at public transit, that there's a mismatch. The routes, where that public transit goes and where my job is. 
This, of course, is the challenge that SMART will have. It doesn't always coincide with where people want to go, especially for that last mile or five miles. There's the politics of mass transit spending. I mean, think of Geary in San Francisco. Uh, it was a bustling afterthought when it has become the primary corridor of the city along with Market Street. Same with Mission. So transit fares, of course, are not going down, even when the price of gas is declining, the price of car insurance is declining. Um, and then there's that, you know, cost of ownership, uh, which many millennials think is worth having a hassle with, at least until they have a much different choice, which may well be the autonomous vehicle. And that membership card that gets you in the fleet and gets you a car within eight, eight minutes. So let's talk about mass transit. Uh, the MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, here, which is our, our Bay Area institution, um, much beloved and much hated, depending on where you are on the debates right now about things like the uh, bike lane on, on the Richmond Bridge. Um, they released some data. It's now um, a little more than a year old, but it's the most recent we have. And they said uh, that the percentage of Bay Area commuters who were taking mass transit, this was as of February 2015, had declined over 20 years. Record ridership, Caltrain, BART, population growth. But the per capita usage of transit dropped since 1991. So despite all the new investments, and think about all the new investments, BART extensions, new light rail systems, new bus lines. What they found is the slice of commuters who were getting into cars, their own cars, was the same basically since the Clinton presidency and since before Clinton took office. Mr. Trump. So 2013, um, the number that MTC published was 1.35 million trips on public transit on a typical weekday. Roll back to 2001, before 9-11, uh, 1.45 million trips on public transit on a typical weekday. So, you know, what to, what to say? Uh, it may, may be that as the AV revolution happens, that will shift, maybe for millennials, maybe for all the rest of us. Uh, but it certainly does raise a question about where should Moran, with a, with a tight budget, you know, it's one of the top five wealthiest counties in the United States. It's still got a tight budget. Um, and the question is, where should those investments go? So this is not kind of idle exercise, right? This is uh, not just futurism. Uh, the old joke among futurists is you put four futurists in a room, you get five different futures described to you. So there's not a lot of agreement among futurists. but. This peering around the corner exercise that we're going through um, is going to probably be frustrating because some of the pieces will be contradictory on the jigsaw puzzle as we start putting, putting our, our, our picture in place. Uh, but there's a high cost to doing nothing. And um, I think we have a chance, particularly in this county, with an aging population, uh, but with a flow of young people and babies coming from the southern part of the Bay Area, from, from below the Golden Gate Bridge, we have a chance to shape it. Because as we say in Silicon Valley, if you're not disrupting something like the transportation industry, you are going to be disrupted. So, the impact on jobs. Think of all those repairmen who are not going to be repairing cars that are um, damaged in a fender bender or worse. I think about the impact of electric vehicles, and all the robotic vehicles are going to be electric vehicles, uh, on the fuel tax, right? We finance the highway system and the upgrade and improvement of the highway system based on the fuel tax. Fuel consumption is going way down as electric vehicle usage goes way up. Parking revenue, driver registration fees, billions of dollars for California. Local taxes, state taxes, federal taxes are going to be in, imbalanced. Maybe insurance, car insurance as we know it, will go away. Uh, the whole balance between rural and urban. If you're living in West Marin, and it would normally 
normally in quotes, be an hour and a half to get to downtown San Francisco from, let's say, Point Reyes, or Bolinas, or Tomales Bay. If a robot is driving me, I, I might actually like that drive. I might certainly like to live in a very quiet, cool spot in the trees. Whereas, you know, if I'm driving that car, it's stressful. I might want to live way closer to my job downtown. So maybe our whole land use and planning strategy is going to have to shift. And maybe the retail future as we know it will be dramatically changed. Because, you know, it wasn't too long ago that Amazon was fighting with, uh, with their competitors to see who could get you two-day delivery. Now, I think some of you know, it's, it's two hours. Um, and they're talking about, you know, drones. So drones are delivering your package, your Amazon package in Europe, and they're about to come here. Uh, that's much faster than two hours. So maybe we won't go to retail stores, or maybe retail stores who don't have to have stock are basically going to be a little, little place close to you that moves around and that you can go and try on shoes. Although, of course, the strategy my friends use is they buy, they buy four pair of shoes and then they return three of them, if not all four of them, because it's a free return policy. So retail economics is going to shift, the job market is going to shift, the tax base is going to shift, um, and you know maybe our lives are going to shift in the process. And this is not for our grandchildren. We thought that about five years ago before this machine learning breakthrough, before deep AI before machine-to-machine -machine communication became more abundant than human-to-machine -machine communication. We passed that point, by the way. So I promised Clayton I wouldn't get you scared about the Terminator future, but I do think that we should nominate Clayton as the person who will communicate with the robots when they decide to debate. That is not we are expendable. He, he says he's thinking about this role in the, diplom in the diplomacy world. So, you know, I, I have a lot of questions about this, and I haven't figured out in my own mind, as an urbanist and a technologist, which part of my brain is in conflict with the other part of my brain. So you're seeing a little bit of this dilemma played out in front of you right now. Uh, but this is not tomorrow, right? A hundred Uber robot cars are on the road in Pittsburgh picking, picking people up today. So to non-Uber robot cars picking people up in Singapore. Fiat Chrysler is building 100 minivans for Google cars for autonomous, and they're expected delivery fairly soon. Uh, and there are some cities, like Centennial, Colorado, which is working with Lyft, uh, and Pinellas Park in Florida, near Tampa, which is working with Uber, where instead of investing in mass transit, those cities are buying you a ticket discounted on Uber because they're saying if it's a choice between getting a new bus line out to that new development or subsidizing your Uber drive, we would rather subsidize the Uber drive than have to buy uh, you know, $295,000 uh, minibus and all the insurance and the driver expense and the bonding and insuring. So bottom line is a lot of choices may be shifted as a result of this. Um, my argument is if 2014 was a year when we had about 100 and, $150 billion of fares that were paid uh, to almost 850 public transit agencies. That's according to the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, you know, what is a city like Kansas City going to do? Cisco's been involved in a public transit project in Kansas City that I've been, I've been very involved in. Well, they turned to a company which is not Uber and not Lyft, a company based in Boston called Bridge with a J, and you'll see some of their uh, vehicles running around the Bay Area, and they're an alternative. Now, they're unionized, which the Boston mayor liked. Um, they're multi-driver. Multi, uh, uh, Right? They can swap out drivers in 24 hours. It can be operating for people who are drinking too much, uh, as they do in Boston at all hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they like to get those people into somebody else drive you please type vehicles. Uh, but not everything is going to be a choice between the two San Francisco-based options of Uber and Lyft. There are a lot of other choices around. You'll see in San Francisco a company called Chariot. Meeting of the Minds, when we organize our program every October, we use Chariot to get our people to and from and around the Bay Area. They're quite good, quite smart, quite safe, 
and we love the fact that it's an alternative to the big choices. So, big revolution in technology translates into potentially a big revolution in economics, which translates into a potentially big revolution in politics, which then hopefully will impact the way we live, work, play, and learn in a place like Moran. So that's the vision, very cloudy, looking around the corner. It's not very clear yet uh, because, of course, the human factor is still to be determined. You haven't been, I bet, in a robotic vehicle yet. You might not like the idea of being in a vehicle driven by a piece of software or many pieces of software. It may, may make you really uncomfortable. And some people may decide to opt out. You know, they haven't really deployed enough vehicles. They've been driving the roads. I see them on 101 all the time. So millions of miles on the Google cars. And of course, every mile, all the other cars are learning because they are in the cloud sharing all the, all the, all the experience of driving in rain or driving near a construction zone that wasn't in the mapping system that they had because Caltrain, Caltrans literally that afternoon put the cones out. Well, the mapping system that was used by the vehicle didn't have time to get updated because it was happening in real time. Caltrans didn't necessarily call Google to say, hey, you know that 101 exit? We're going to have cones. So how do these cars adapt? They work with each other. And so as machines communicate with machines, and people hopefully benefit from that, the choices that we have are going to be not so much the technology choices, although those are really fun and interesting, and they're sexy, and they're glamorous, and it's kind of bright, shiny. Uh, object, which of course is the source of a lot of fascination, and we're talking about it today. The real choice is going to be what do humans do in response. One prediction is there's going to be a major backlash against the loss of jobs, and we will see riots as millions of truck drivers lose their jobs because trucking companies decide it's a lot cheaper to have a robot drive than a potentially drowsy, drunk, distracted truck driver who ups their insurance policy every time he hits somebody. If the truck's owners decide to do that, we might see you know, whole, whole interstates shut down by angry truck drivers. If we don't think ahead, if we don't think about other job options for people who drive trucks. So, I've scared you enough. Hopefully this is good for your digestion. Uh, and I leave it to Clayton to figure out what we do next. So, we're going to ask you to do it. Okay. Are we, uh, we're on. Um, before we get started, I have to say I was raised on a street that had a lot of rail traffic, and when you were talking about the, the uh, guy sitting there in the cab with nothing to do, I think it reminded me of the guy in the caboose that used to ride at the back of all the trains, and he was probably the best red man in America <laughs> with a good union job. Yeah, with a hell, very good union job. Judy. Thank you, Gordon, for a very informative and interesting and challenging talk. With all the repercussions that I had, sorry, all the repercussions that I hadn't quite considered, but one of the things you didn't talk about perhaps was the possibility of hacking and what that might do are the AI machines learning about hacking as well and duplicitousness and things like that. Great, great question. So this is a big problem, of course, the car companies are now facing up to. Uh, they didn't want to talk about it until, of course, those first hacks occurred. I believe it was a, uh, a Jeep uh, Cherokee that was hacked about a year and a half ago by some people who were basically at a conference on the future of autonomous vehicles, and they raised their hand. They said, well, while we've been here, we hacked into the Jeep Cherokee, which is the one test drive that they were offering, and they took control. So they, they didn't even report about something that they had done the week before. They did it on site. Uh, we don't use permission, of course. Fortunately, uh, the Jeep Cherokee management team hired them right away to fix, to fix the, 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 before the competitors hired them. Uh, so they turned them from what are called black hat hackers to white hat hackers. And when you see the new Snowden film uh, by Oliver Stone that's in the theaters, I guess starting this weekend, I think you'll, you'll realize that this is, this is a key source of vulnerability. Now, this is a problem that's solvable. 
uh, but it requires collaboration by the automakers and by the software producers. Now, some of those are going to be holdouts. They're not going to necessarily want to play together in the same sandbox because it's a life and death struggle between GM and Ford and Toyota, let alone Nissan and, you know, and all the rest. So will they decide that they want to collaborate on a common global security standard? Will it be a strong common global security standard? And will there always be a 15-year-old frustrated boy in Forrest Knoll who's got a really good internet connection who decides to show the world who's boss? I think the answer is probably, you know, maybe to all of that. But that's the scenario we're facing. And where there have been risks in, you know, the past. Obviously, the risk with, with a horse-based economy uh, was that we would have poop everywhere. Now, that, that was resolved because there was a technology transition. There may be another technology transition that happens as we go along on this merry road. Um, Gordon, just to feedback back a little bit on what Judy said, you, you talked a lot about efficiency, but you didn't talk about freedom. And I think that what you framed is you framed, it's kind of the technocrat financial lead argument that freedom is really, really scary and really, really bad, and we have to give up our freedom for efficiency. And I'm not really concerned about hackers and scary terrorists. I'm concerned about having multinational corporations who are not necessarily um, acting in our best interests and, corp and, and governments, which are controlled by those multinational corporations, international banks, having the ability to control where we travel, when we travel, and if we're deemed to be not uh, having the right thoughts based on our internet searches and the things we say, then we won't be able to travel at all. Now, with a personal passenger vehicle now, anybody in this room can get in their car and they can travel when they want, where they want. And the government and the multinational corporations don't have any, any say in that. With autonomous vehicles, that freedom will be gone and gone forever. So that's my main concern. It's a great, it's a great comment and well taken. So think about progressive insurance. Uh, those of you who may be a progressive insurance policyholder for your car insurance, they put a little device in your car to see uh, remotely how you're driving and they give you a very strong incentive uh, in your reduced premium to adopt so it's a very tempting uh, kind of proposition. You know, if you let us track, if you let our machines track you here at Progressive, we know whether you're a good driver. Um, and the very act of allowing us to install that will reduce your monthly premium for your car insurance. So my concern about the future that you're describing, which is a real concern, uh, is that it's a very slippery slope, right? So it doesn't start with, the day you say, I'm giving up my freedom in order to have the better option available, the cheaper option, the more efficient option, whatever that better future option is. I, I'm absolutely convinced that this automated, autonomous vehicle of the future is happening now, and there will be very strong incentives, price incentives, convenience incentives, and otherwise, to get all of us to adopt those vehicles. And I think in most cases, it's going to be a beneficial experience. But there are going to be people who, as you say, may either opt out because they want to retain their choices, or they may be opted out because they're not well. And this is, you know, this is part of the debate that we need to have. Right now, we're not having this debate. Right now, of course, as I said, the human factor is not the factor that's being talked about. It's mostly the technology factor, because it's bright and shiny. And I'm hoping that maybe a little bit today we're starting to talk about the human side of it, like our free choices. So I'd like to piggyback on that, if I might. Um, it sounds like you're suggesting that a majority of the population will move into this autonomous vehicle lifestyle. I can't imagine it could ever be 100%. And that's why I'm interested in, in what you would say about this, because there's always going to be the person the gardener, the electrician, who has to have their own vehicle to take their their setup with them to work. As a music teacher, I had so much gear in the back of my car, there's no way I could, even if it was a big van, want to do the load and the unload all the time. 
So that's one thing. And the other is long distance trips. If I want to go to the Grand Canyon, I want to have my own vehicle for this. And I'm not sure I want to rent one every time because I'd like to stock it, et cetera, et cetera. So those were two questions I had. The other was about refueling. Is there some imagination about how refueling these vehicles will work? Sure. Uh, the last one is the easy one, and I'll go to the hard ones. Uh, basically, your robot will refuel when you're not using it. So if that's... Well, where and who pays for it? Uh, well, you know, PG, PG&E is retrofitting all, all the parts of their network to be able to allow your, your electric vehicle to recharge anywhere, anytime, and uh, wirelessly. So wireless recharging of your vehicle, either inductive recharging where you stand at your vehicle over the spot or over the air. So that's 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 around the corner. So that'll be the power grid. The power grid. The power grid, of course. You know, we're dealing with PG&E. We're all PG&E customers, so we know what that's like. Uh, so this is big, this is a big problem for the EV revolution, not just the AV, but the electric vehicle revolution. Is are the, is the grid ready? A lot of what's being discussed, and this is why Solar City and Tesla are emerging. If the if the shareholders approve that in their vote this next week, um, is that. The electric vehicle and your micro generation on your rooftop, your solar are, are going to be essentially combined and that you won't depend on the grid to recharge because you'll have enough storage. This is the vision that Solar City and Tesla have for an EV future where you are essentially living at home in the power plant. And during the daytime, you're capturing the electrons and during the night when they're stored, you can recharge your vehicle. And this is a happy cycle. And that's the vision that Solar City and Tesla have together. Obviously, PG&E doesn't like that vision because they're investing in the grid. Even if it's an inadequate grid, they worry about that. But back to your important question about choice. So this is the messy problem of every technology transition, is having to live with the both and and not just either or world, where you'll have frail, distracted, drunk, tired human drivers on the road simultaneously with relatively perfect robotic drivers. Uh, and you'll maintain your choice, and the two of you there at the table are going to adamantly you know, hold the line against this, and there will be lots of people like that until maybe the government decides that you don't have any choice anymore. Uh, but the messy part is that the robot cars are gonna have to figure out, are you distracted? So they are now developing technology uh, Toyota currently sells it and installs it as a basic part of your package that looks in your eyes from the from the console. And if it sees that you're distracted or if it sees that you're tired, uh, it will slow down. But it will also tell the other cars in the area that you're a troublemaker. Uh, so keep that in mind because you know this is this is where your your government wants to know who bad drivers are. Mine was partially covered by Martha, but uh, what about vacation vehicles? Uh, are you going to restrict our freedom that we can't go take a 10-hour drive up to Oregon to see a relative or uh, I, I go camping be, in the I hate to in be the, the advocate. Woods? I hate to be the advocate of, or perceived as the advocate for robot cars, but I, but I guess I'm now being being a pigeonholed as the the guy who wants the future to be limited. Um, <laughs> Uh, my guess is that you're going to have a lot more freedom and free time as autonomous robotic technologies start taking uh, various drudgery tasks away. The theory is that you're going to have more time to go to Oregon in your car and enjoy you know, the coastline and the beer, the microbreweries. There will probably be more microbreweries then than there are now, which is amazing because there's more microbreweries than there are people who drink beer. But the point is, I, I doubt they're going to want to take that away because, you know, we think of the California economy, very tourism dependent. Uh, nobody's going to take that piece of the income away. I just want to make an insight. One of the comments that I made at the, the Mill Valley City Council meetings, I think one of the reasons so many of the uh, houses downtown are so expensive is because it's a place where you can walk to drink. And, um, <laughs> yes, alcohol yeah, was a major factor yeah. in all revolutions. Yes, yeah. uh, but I want to make the case for telecommuting just because I, I, I fail to really give adequate force behind telecommuting. And I just want to read you a couple of stats. I looked on a, on a, a data site called the Global Workplace Analytics. 
So here it is, American Census Bureau. 50% of everybody has a job which is compatible for telecommuting, which sometimes is called telework or remote work or mobile work or distributed work or smart work or in Canada they call it work shifting, whatever that is. Basically work at home. So 20 to 25% of those people are telecommuting with some frequency. 80 to 90% of people surveyed who have jobs would like to work at least part-time, and they mean like two to three days a week. Who doesn't? Who doesn't want to work from home? Except if you hate your spouse, I guess. Uh, but here it is, Fortune 1000 companies, I visit a lot of them, uh, are revamping all of their spaces. Because frankly, if you go to these companies, there aren't a lot of people at those job sites. They prefer to work either on the road or from home. So the surveys say that most people are not at their desk 50 to 60% of the time that they're in the work building. So the average telecommuter is a very desirable demographic. College educated, 49 years old, 58,000 year salary, um, and they're working in a place with more than 100 employees. Now, 75% of all telecommuters earn more than 65,000 a year. They're in the upper 80th percentile of all employees. So I would imagine Marin's future would be very interesting if we had not just ubiquitous wired connectivity through cable, but also high-speed wireless broadband reaching everywhere. And I know that that's not the case today. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have a question. First of all, I wondered if you could give us a few more statistics, not about how many cars are going to come off the road, but more around how many car trips are going to come off the road. And, um, and I'm, I'm motivated to ask this question is because what you're talking about doesn't take any cars off the road. It just shifts ownership of that car. And when I look at Marin, and I look at, you know, 20 to 25% of uh, cars on the road are school-related transportation. Okay, and when we got when we had Prop 13, we got rid of all the school buses. There's a huge financial incentive to bring school buses back. Yet we have not done it. So you talk about financial incentives and the actual number of cars that you're going to take off the road. I'm not under, I'm not seeing the correlation of people actually adopting yep. for those reasons. Good question. Great question because it goes right to this point I wanted to make that if if we're looking at the potential implications before the bad sh stuff happens, we could actually have policies in place to improve the outcomes. So the improved outcome would be less car trips because less vehicle miles traveled, less congestion, we need to repair our roads less, we have you know, less time in a, tra in a trip and more time with each other because uh, I think it's probably more fun to actually interact with a person than a robot, even if the robot is driving you around. Um, so one answer, of course, is we don't know. We don't know what the impact, I'm, I, I was guessing in all of these impacts. Now we have some past experience with technology disruption in the economy, but nothing like the one that we're about to have. So these were not in prior times connected to us, connected to the network, connected to each other. These were machines like the telephone, uh, which did connect us, but you know, frankly, it wasn't that much different from the telegraph. It had voice, but it was one to one. And now we're talking one to many and many to many in our communication system. So one easy uh, answer to avoid answering is to say, we don't know, but we can guess. And my guess is if we take a certain path, we're gonna have a lot less congestion on our roads. If we take the hell approach, we're gonna have a lot of zombie cars floating around doing little errands every time, oh my God, I should probably go and get some wildflowers for you know my, my aunt who's visiting, but I don't really have the time to go and get wildflowers, so I'm gonna send my robot car to the flower shop, which I never would have done. My aunt would have survived if she'd never had the wildflowers when she arrived. So this debate about what policies would Marin or the Bay Area through, God forbid, ABAC, or the broader California state legislature, what should the policies be that will discourage zombie cars and other behaviors that will increase the likelihood of greater vehicle miles traveled as a result of this technology transition? My hope is we all travel less, 
and we spend more time in our neighborhoods, and we get to know each other, and we get to work together on improving our neighborhoods. And yes, we do have robotic cars, and they take us places, and maybe they do errands for us, but we have incentives to, to discourage overuse of a new resource. Can you describe an incentive? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. that already. <laughs> 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 there would be a policy that says if we license your fleet, and there's nobody in your vehicle, there is an extra fee to the city from the vehicle owner slash fleet manager that every zombie car that doesn't have anybody in it that's wandering around looking for the next ride or waiting for you to finish your dental appointment is going to essentially cost that much more. And I will reconfigure my planning. Excuse me, can we move? Uh, uh, we, we should probably, we have a couple more people to sure. want to. And um, yeah, I really hope, uh, Gordon, with regard to the uh, school transportation problem here, uh, maybe you could touch a little on the issue of the software from Chariot and how it could probably eliminate that entire problem altogether. But here we go. Yeah, yeah two quick questions uh, or comments. Uh, Facebook uh, requires that their engineers and non-engineers work in Menlo Park. I have friends here in Marin who work there. This is, uh, you know, this telecommuting thing is not working for most large technology companies. I work in one in the city. Uh, we have Thursdays off, but most people work on site. Um, so yeah. that, that's a fantasy that it's just not going to happen. It's not a uniform story. I'll tell you. Cisco, yeah, absolutely. And Cisco, and less so, than twenty percent of people at Cisco show up in the buildings. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that's, uh, you can see how well Cisco's doing. Um, to the point here about uh, to the point here about uh, miles traveled. Um, I believe, so I'm a mathematician by, uh, by training, uh, I firmly believe that autonomous vehicles are going to increase traffic substantially because, let me give you one example, my son uh, drives now, but he didn't, uh, he wants to go visit his buddy in Novato, he would never do it at 5 o'clock, but with an autonomous vehicle, why not? Gets in the car, he uh, plays YouTube or some video game along the way, and now the traffic, instead of being 45 minutes to Novato, it's an hour and a half to Novato. He doesn't care, but everybody else cares. So I, I think this, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, um, you know, I'm in the business, and I think uh, we're kidding ourselves that we can replace match transit with autonomous vehicles. Good. That's good to hear. I'll, I'll say one thing. If you're blind or you're disabled and not legally qualified to drive in some other manner. There are definitely or issues, you know, just like you, you Uber. Know. Uber is not let, gonna take uh, over the world. You know. let, let him respond we can first to your yeah. comment. No, I right. absolutely agree there are cases. So all, all of your suggestions, absolutely to the point. It's not a monochromatic situation in Silicon Valley. Some companies don't like telecommuting, some do. Uh, my experience is working at Apple and working at other places as I have, the companies that do encourage it have people who are generally more productive. If they can take a day or two off and not fight traffic to get to their work and collaborate with each other through video conferencing or other means, uh, they tend to be happier people. Uh, I was just on the Facebook campus. They're all happy because there's a lot of mating going on. They're all 20-somethings who are not married, so that's, that's part of what, uh, what makes the Facebook uh, office life very, uh, very, very lucrious. <laughs> quick question. Yeah. I have one quick question, very specific to Marin. We have a lot of hills here, and a great many people live in those hills. Can you give us a time frame when autonomous vehicles will be able to navigate those steep, wide vegetation obscured roads? Well, it doesn't depend on the, the current technology as of today, doesn't depend on having a good map or a picture that, like Street View provides you on Google of where that tree might be overhanging. Uh, the reality is that with the, the machine learning technology and the machine vision technology, even if the street hasn't been mapped in advance, as many streets have, but not all, uh, they can make it up that hill. And so the good news is that it's now. The, the rural service and the urban service are pretty much identical from the standpoint of the machine. The problem is the same. Do I see where the other car is? Do I see where the pedestrian is? Do I see where the intersection is? And there are rules, and then I'm learning as I go hopefully before I arrive. Scott. 
despite what's going on in Singapore with early adoption, I, I think I'm an early resistor. Uh, That's why I came here. I, would, I, I, I almost counted on resistance to, to, back. to well, the program. Of course. And, you know, what you're talking about is, is clearly a cutting-edge, futuristic kind of thing. Um, two issues I haven't heard specifically addressed, so let me throw those out. One is the environmental impact or lack thereof. One gentleman mentioned that uh, this isn't going to take any cars off the road. It's just going to shift ownership, which is kind of the way I, I perceive it as well. I like owning my car. I've got a 17-year-old station wagon. It costs me nothing. Uh, I insure it for you know a few bucks a year. I don't see any reason to shift the ownership of my vehicle to another company that's going to charge me each time I, I have a use. Uh, but if someone could say to me, well, you've got a, a gas guzzler and if you get rid of that, all of your future rides are going to reduce your carbon footprint. That would be an incentive. So I'm assuming you're talking about mostly electronic autonomous vehicles. But yeah, I mean, they, so far they all are. Yeah, so that's, that's one question. The other question I have, and again, I haven't heard this addressed, but to me it's the most fundamental one. Do these things work? I mean, every week you hear of an accident involving an autonomous vehicle that didn't realize that there was a semi in front of it because the semi starts about five feet off the ground and the sensor for the car was looking straight on and didn't detect that there was something in front of it. And so it goes crashing into the truck. Uh, maybe, you know, as a tech person, you're going to say, well, that's a bug, we'll work it out. But I'm dealing with an email server or an email, uh, whatever they call it, platform. Uh, called Outlook, which has been on the market, what, 25 years? Yeah. Every goddamn time I turn on my email, there's a bug. Yeah. So you can't convince me that some yeah. autonomous car is going to be perfect technology. I'm sorry. Those are NSA bugs, by the way. They're, they're, they're specifically designed to annoy you. So, so here, here's, the, here's the thing is, I, you know, Cisco doesn't have an axe to grind. We don't have a, 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 a dog in this fight. So we're not selling autonomous vehicles or technology to those guys. Um, so I'm not advocating for this. I want to make that clear, and I should have done it at the beginning. I'm, I'm here to provoke you, which I hope I'm doing a relatively good job. As you can see, I'm, I'm sweating up here. Um, so the environmental impacts, I think, are going to be positive and real, not just because we're transitioning to EVs. If a V world happens, it's an EV world powered by, hopefully, clean electrons, um, hopefully, clean electrons that are captured in micro generation on the rooftop and not big power facilities that take up lots of space in the desert from the big turtles who need their space. So hopefully that's one positive impact. The second is a lot less materials go into a vehicle. And of course, every new material is basically new carbon. Um, and if it's a lighter vehicle because it's not in accidents, as all of the AVs now are, are being planned for, a, less accident-prone future, um, that means not just less weight on the road, which means less repair of the road, which means less blacktop on the road, but it also means hopefully less fuel is being consumed, whether it's an electron or a hydrocarbon. The point is that the hope is that the impacts are going to be positive as this plays itself out. Now, that's the scenario for the advocates. The People who worry, remember I said it's heaven or hell, depending on how the human factor plays out here. If it's hell, it's going to be a much more congested future. And maybe, you know, even though EVs, AVs don't have to idle as much and they're therefore more efficient drivetrains, more efficient use of whatever fuel they have, the reality is that more congestion is more congestion is more congestion. So we don't know. Again, my, my whole premise here is nobody knows. The technology advocates think they do. The resistors think they know. The rest of us are confused. That's going to be for a while. Um, I have a hard stop at 115, so you may have okay. almost the last question. Okay, uh, two questions, I think. Uh, one is, um, what kinds of infrastructure does this sort of system require that uh, the public may, may be asked to yep. uh, pay for? And um, secondly, um, as these cars are, are learning, people are going to be learning also. And they may learn, oh, that car will stop for me. I'm going to step in front of that car. And sort of like it's the happened. way our, our wildlife learns in a state park. They know they're not going to be shot. 
And then I can foresee the demand by the um, EV folks, we need to have our own lanes and we need to have our own space on the roads. Yep. And that obviously that takes the way away the less choice for the rest of us, sure. so just comment on that. And she was talking about the coexistence of the old and the new. It may be that we have to separate them from each other, but the good answer is all of the technology is, is basically machine inside the vehicle talking wirelessly to the cloud. All they need is a white line in the road. So that's the only infrastructure that's really required. Some technologies, of course, require the vehicle communicating to a box in the road that is transmitting a signal, or other vehicles who are using something called DSRC, which is a certain piece of the telecom spectrum. Uh, but the, the, the nice thing is there are a lot of technology choices competing with each other right now. We don't even know which technology is gonna become dominant. Google people think theirs is. Ford has an alternative approach. GM is pursuing something with Lyft, which will be entirely different than what Uber is doing with Toyota. Who knows? Uh, Gordon, I'm, 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 Gordon I'm is all of them will be. <clears throat> You've come to your hard stop. Thank you. Uh, let's give a hard <laughs>